want to thank you once again for joining us this week. Uh, the last few weeks we have been talking about the importance of the gospel. We have learned what the core salvific doctrines are. But the Christian life does not stop with the explanation of the gospel. It does not even stop with someone accepting the gospel. Too many times there are people who acknowledge the gospel and people who even say they believe the gospel, but that's where it stops. As we saw last week, though, our response includes an inevitability of a changed life, one that is changed into the image of Christ. To do this, we must grow. But without telling people how to grow, we can leave people without a way to figure out how to grow individually or, cor or corporately and, in effect, kill the spiritual life. We grow spiritually both individually and communally. While there can be an argument for other biblical means by which a, a person can grow spiritually, for instance, through service or tithe, the primary ways a Christian grows individually is by the word and prayer. Both of these spiritual disciplines go hand in hand. We cannot understand the word without the help of the spirit, hence the need for prayer. We cannot pray rightly without the help of God's word to tell us how. Hence the need for the Spirit to speak primarily through His Word. There is no reason why every single disciple of Jesus should not be reading His Word and communing with His Spirit in prayer on a daily basis. Yet consistency seems to be an issue in today's church. Individually, Christians should be absorbing Scripture and praying daily, as well as knowing how to explain that to someone else. Every Christian should be able to explain at least the importance of it in the life of a believer. But there is also a lack of consistency as it concerns corporate growth. Corporately, we need to understand and be teaching the importance of being involved in a local congregation and how someone can get invested in the life of a church family as well as learning ourselves how to involve other people in our church. We need to understand that being a part of a church family body is extremely important in the life of a believer. But today as we start off with this block, we start off by talking about how we grow individually. Specifically, we talk about the importance of studying scripture and start talking about how to study scripture for yourself. One of the biggest causes of destruction in the church today stems not from political power or inner church struggles, it is stemmed from a lack of biblical competency. People do not know how to read the Word of God for themselves. This is one of the largest tragedies in the church today. Scripture itself shows how important it is to stay in the Word. 1 Peter 2.2 says this, Like newborn infants, desire the pure spiritual milk, so that you may grow by it for your salvation. This newborn milk, that Peter uses is an analogy for the Word of God. The Word of God is integral for growth. Without growth, people's spiritual lives will stagnate and eventually die. We need to be in the Word to grow. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14 says, We have a great deal to say about this, and it's difficult to explain since you have become too lazy to understand. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now, everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. The writer of Hebrews shows this progression from growth to maturity as he confronts his audience with the fact that that they have digressed into this spiritual immaturity and that they need the basics once again in order to grow. You cannot grow into maturity without first knowing the basic foundations that are found in Scripture. Finally, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The Word equips us for every good work that God has for us. 
for everything that we need to be able to please God, the Word has an answer for us. The Bible tells us how to live our lives in a way pleasing to God. It is, complete, it is completely sufficient for the life of a believer. It contains all that we need to be able to follow His will for our lives. But there are numerous reasons why people do not study the Bible. Howard Hendricks, in his book, writes several different reasons people give. One being that people say it's not relevant to their daily lives. There are some out there who think the Bible is a dated book that has no bearing on how we live today. There are some people who say that they don't know how to read the Bible. They look into Scripture and they get intimidated while making the text more difficult than it actually is. Then they just stop reading it entirely. There are some who think that you need some kind of special training or degree to be able to read the Word. Which usually leads people to say that this isn't their responsibility. There are some who think that it is only the pastor who has this responsibility. Or is, only, or is the only one who can interpret it rightly. Finally, there are some people who say that it really just isn't that interesting. That it's boring to them. But we not only see in Scripture... But in through our daily growth, in growing through Scripture, that none of these reasons are true, good, or accurate. We see that these reasons are really just excuses. Anyone in right relationship with God can read Scripture for themselves and understand it. And as we grow, we gain. What's more, God wants you to understand it. His Word is available for you to read, interpret, and apply. If that wasn't so, we wouldn't have it today. What we need to do then is to show a method that will reteach how to read the word rightly in order to show how simple it is to understand the word for yourself. Does it take some work? Absolutely. But nothing good in this life comes easy. And through challenging ourselves with the word, we will become better. So the word is not something to avoid. The challenges of working through a passage is not something to avoid at all. It's a good thing in order that you might grow, mature, and be equipped for God's purposes. Vine Street Baptist, deriving material from Howard Hendricks' Living by the Book, from Jim Andrews' Hermeneutics, which will be published soon, and Donald Whitney's Spiritual Disciplines book, we have developed a step-by-step -step Bible reading guide so that you will be able to know a process to assist you in reading the word accurately for yourself. What this reading guide will do, it will give you a simple process of reading the word that will get you the most out of it. You will gain confidence, growth, joy as you read and apply the word rightly in your life. A few suggestions as we move forward. Be open to daily devotional time. Be open to change in your life. Be open to God and his work. Now, according to Jim Andrews, there are three rules we must remember when dealing with Scripture. One, always read the Bible in context. Two, always read the Bible in context. And three, always read the Bible in context. Context is where a passage is placed in the text, the grammatical literary structure, what the surrounding passages are, what the historical cultural background that led to the writing of the text, what the genre is, what the theological context, or how does this book fit and compare with the rest of Scripture, or what is the theological understanding of time. That's what the context of Scripture is. Remember that Scripture will never contradict itself. If we see a discrepancy, the problem is not with the text. It's with our interpretation or application. The key to studying Scripture rightly is remembering authorial intent. And what that means is this. What did the author mean when he wrote a passage? The author determines meaning, not us. We determine significance or application principles. But the author determines meaning. There are some blunders that we must watch out for when reading the Bible. Things we need to beware of that are connected. Sometimes people take things out of context. And it leads to faulty interpretation, which can ultimately lead to bad theology and ideas that God isn't saying at all. Things that you, things that you can be led astray with. 
For instance, one of the most misused passages is Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. By itself, some people have taken this to mean that I can do anything I want or gain the life I want here on earth with all of the riches and glory if I just work hard enough and I want it because God will give it to me because God is backing me. This is literally how some people will take this verse and even get it tattooed on their arms or put it as their motto without realizing what this really means here. And in it, they commit a blunder of what we call verse cherry picking. Verse numbers, we need to understand, are not inspired. They can be helpful at times, but they are not present in the original text. The letters and books were meant to be read as one. The verse numbers were added on later to be helpful for people in reading the text, but those verse numbers are not inspired. It is only the text itself that is inspired. The problem with people misusing this particular verse is that they forget a crucial detail of not only the surrounding context of the verse, but also the historical context. And that is this. When Paul wrote this passage right here, he was at the time in prison and suffering. The surrounding context talks about persevering during times of hardship and persecution. Times that Paul makes clear are inevitable for the believer. The entire meaning of this statement is changed when we realize this context. Paul is talking about persevering in the faith in the face of horrible circumstances and being able to overcome those horrible circumstances and persevere in the faith with the help of God, not gaining material wealth. But verse cherry picking happens constantly. Another great blunder is finding principles unrelated to the text. When I was in college, I would bring theological papers to my father, who was a former Bible college professor. He would read them over for me, and every once in a while he would look at me and say this, this idea is great, but does this specific text support the idea? Now me and my brain would think, of course it does. My father and I would debate, and he would win. Why? Because I had taken things out of context and instead placed my own meaning into the text, not what the author had intended. This is the difference between eisegetical and exegetical study. Eisegetical study says that you put your own meaning into the text. Whatever the text means to you is whatever it means. But here's the thing. The text can only have one meaning, as we will see later. Possible multiple applications, but only one meaning. It is the author that determines meaning, not us, which is why we promote exegetical study, the process of discovering what the author meant. We are not putting meaning into the text. We are discovering what the text already means. We are not trying to make the Bible relevant. We are discovering how it is already relevant and timeless. The problem with putting ideas in the text that the text isn't talking about, no matter who, how true the idea might be, is that we take away the authorial intent. At that point, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say and mean whatever you want it to mean. It becomes subjective. And at that point, you can justify any sin on earth, none of which are pleasing to God or using his word rightly. Instead, it is offensive to God. So these are things we must be careful of. But there is one final thing we have to be mindful of. That is, pre-understandings or biases. Pre-understandings are inevitable. We all come to the text with ideas we think are true before we read the text. The key is not to try to remove those pre-understandings for our thinking, for that's impossible. But not only is it impossible, sometimes it can also be theologically dangerous. So we have to balance between understanding our presuppositions and biases our pre-understanding of the text and not placing those into the text because remember, we are trying to discover what the author means, not put our own ideas into it. But sometimes, trying to remove all our biases can be dangerous. For instance, a Christian comes to the text with the pre-understanding of certain key, key Christian doctrines. For instance, like Jesus is God. Having a pre-understanding before you get into the text does not mean the idea is wrong or that the Bible will disagree with the idea. 
We just need to be open to the idea that our pre-understandings could be wrong. Remember, the Bible is the final authority, not our theological systems or pre-understandings about the text. The text determines truth. We do not put truth into the text. The Bible will either confirm or refute an idea. According to Jim Andrews, there are a few safeguards that can help us with this. First, recognize the myth of pure objectivity. We will always come to the text with pre-understandings. You will never be able to get rid of biases you have before you come to the text. Surface your presuppositions, secondly. Figure out what your pre-understandings, what your ideas might be before you come to the text. Three, confront the text honestly. Recognize that your pre-understandings and ideas could be wrong or incomplete. Four, demand compelling evidence before putting a lock on your position. Do not settle into a theological position unless you have compelling, legitimate, biblical proof and research. Five, consider openness to change a mark of character. A mark of spiritual maturity is the openness to look in the mirror and recognize that we can all be wrong. And that's okay as long as we are open to correction. Six, remember that the admission of error is the affordable price of truth. But blindness is the hidden cost of pride and prejudice. We must understand that we are going to have biases and presuppositions before we come to the text. But the question is, are we humble enough to let the Bible determine whether those ideas are true or whether we need to toss them? Now in the next session, we will talk about this process, which includes three simple steps. Observation, interpretation, application. What do I see? What does it mean? And how does it work? We will also be showing you different resources that will be helpful for you as well. But right now we thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you again at the next session.